Cool. Well, I think we probably should get started for this evening. Um, so Rex has graciously taken on the speaking responsibilities for tonight. Um, tonight we're going to finish, we're pretty much going to finish up chapters 20, our command check, and then 22, releasing the crayon. Um, I think depending on how far we get tonight, I think this is going to be it. So once we kind of wrap up these two chapters, you know, I'll, you know, open it up for any questions and comments. And then once we get finished with that, we'll just have some parting words and then, um, we'll go from there. So I really appreciate, uh, Rex taking on tonight's discussion. And so I'll turn it over to you, Rex. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'll just share screen. Um, quick thing so I don't get distracted. Um, so uh, the R command check chapter is a bit like, I don't know, it's a bit interesting. It's pretty much like every possible way the check could fail. Um, and it's like really uh, detailed about, you know, like all these different things that could go wrong. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the bits that like sort of stood out to me and um, are like particularly interesting. But for the full version, I like, definitely check out the documentation, uh, the the um, the the full chapter. Um, so I mean, first off, um, the ARM command check is a terminal command, um, whereas the dev tools check um, is sort of indirectly running it. Um, and the control like or command shift E is also sort of doing similar things, but there are some subtle differences between the dev tools check and the, um, the like R studio, I don't know, the, the built-in like command shift E version. Um, so the dev tools check also like updates the documentation. Um, whereas I don't, I don't think the command shift E version does by default. Um, and the dev tools check bundles before checking. And it's a bit safer because it avoids some necessary files that you might have with um, compiled code. And it sets a not CRAN environment uh, variable to be true. Um, so there's a few things that you can get back from a check. Um, I know we've sort of covered this before, but um, ensure there's errors, which are big problems. There's warnings, which are little problems and notes, which are things that like, you should avoid if you want to get on to CRAN. Um, so, so errors sort of, I think they stop the check often. They're just like big, big problems. So um, yeah, they're the, they're the things to avoid. Um, and with the nodes, um, something that like is, is worth getting rid of all of them. And if you do have any and you're submitting to CRAN, then you should mention them. So in your um, submission to CRAN that I'll, I'll talk about later in the next chapter on 22, um, you'll include this like CRAN comments um, .md file, and you'll include like the results from a check, possibly across multiple systems, and the errors or warnings or notes that come along with that. Um, and uh, it's really common to get like maybe one note, if, especially if compiled code, because the file size of the package might be really big, um, and that that'll produce a, a note. You know, the part, you know it's more than five megabytes or one megabyte or whatever the um, the threshold is to make a note about it, make it noteworthy. Um, and also if you're submitting a package for the first time to CRAN, that will produce a note of itself. And you should include that on the CRAN comments sort of preemptively um, that there'll be one. So there's, yeah, there's 50 checks um, for a full list, have a, have a squeeze of the book. Um, but broadly there's some on metadata, the structure of the package, um, such as like where, where things are, whether they're in the right place or not. Um, if you followed the book up till now, things will probably be in the right place. Um, so that probably not a huge problem. Um, a lot of things will get checked within the description file. Um, for example, the license and the dependencies, um, as well as your namespace. And that's like, um, I often get caught out if I'm using the like control shift E to quickly check things um, because it doesn't run document. So I won't have updated the namespace since I make the last change in the code. And then it'll say like, oh, you didn't explore this function or you didn't um, you know, do the thing that you're expecting to have happened when you're doing the check. So um, yeah, it also checks for that. 
and we'll also check for um, problems with the R code, but often this you might already know about before you run the check because if you run load all you'll it'll always it will come up with a sort of warning if something's gone awry there already um and just to know that you can't access functions from other packages which, which aren't exported this will also come up with a check it might work in the load all but and like it might work for like running a test but um the check will say that you shouldn't do it um I know we talked about this earlier in the book club, like what should you do if you wanna use a function from another package that's maybe really small, you don't wanna import it as a dependency um, or maybe it's not exported. Um, and in this section of the book, it says uh, you're not allowed to use, you're not allowed to access those non-exported functions. If you do, then you should either ask the package maintainer of that, um, of that package that you're getting this function from to export the function that you need or to write your own version of it um, or to write your own version of it using exported functions. Alternatively, if the licenses are compatible, you can copy and paste that function into your package and, um, and say where it's from and update the um, description to include the author or the maintainer of, the, um, of that parent package that you're cutting that um, function from as an author of yours. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the recommended way around that one. I'd also checks, um, so for S3 um, objects and generic, um, it checks for what, generic and method consistency. Um, for example, it's, it's really looking at these arguments, the use of arguments within S3 methods. So for example, this is the print, um, the function for the print method. Um, and it has arguments X and the optional extra arguments is three dots. By having these extra three dots, um, you, can, you can add to your print methods for your objects extra arguments of whatever you like. Um, for example, you can add some other argument um, to your print method like so. You can't not include the three dots. So this is this is bad. And of course you can use the exact same arguments as that um, original method. Um, so so yeah it's sort of um, just making sure that there's consistency across the methods that you're using. Obviously, if you're making your own method, that's not a uh, generic like print or predict or plot or summary, then then you can make them up yourself and you know probably not have this have this issue. Or have to think so hard about it because you're defining that method yourself, you know. Um, don't use assign to modify objects in the global environment. If you need to maintain state across function calls, create your own environment and set and get values in it. Um, so this is, um, yeah, you don't want to mess around with things in your global environment and the check will tell you when you're doing that. So um, for example, it says to create an environment yourself um, and then and then mess with that. Um, I didn't fully under understand like where I would want to be doing this, um, but a practice that I'm working on does mess around with this, so maybe I'll get a kickback and have to learn a lot more about it soon. Um, does anyone have any any comments on on this? It sort of reminds me of. Um, like when when I've used a progress bar pack or progress package and you have like a, a adding a tick and it's sort of like keeping a recollection of of something in in that object but that's sort of like a more object oriented thing and I think that's a reference class object um, the progress bar uses um, for example here you're sort of like um, updating an object um i guess within this specific environment rather than in the global environment and it's saying that you shouldn't update things in the global environment you should specify a specific environment for that um and i guess that's what 
you know, you shouldn't be messing with people's global environments unless you really have to. I think I'll get to that later in the um, in the release in the crown as well. That like you shouldn't do anything to someone's um, system without you know them being really well informed about about that. Rex, if you don't mind me interrupting, the, mm. the word reference class, are we, are, are you're, you're making a, uh, a, a reference to the R6 class, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, I think so. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Well, I think, I think in R6, it's more of a classic C concept of inheritance then. So that would make sense about, uh, yeah. being specific of what area that you're affecting, you def definitely don't want to modify the person's global environment. Um, but within that small window of cache area that your memory is allocated, you can manipulate as needed and it won't have any detrimental effect. Hmm. That's almost like a security yeah. <laughs> security type uh, bridge if, if you were to go that route anyway. Yeah, so keeping it within the object rather than, um, yeah. I was thinking too, like there's some packages that I use that and I'm sure many of us probably have used them before, but like cache credentials. So like you'll you'll authenticate with a with an outside third party service. It would cache those credentials somewhere, and then you use those cache credentials throughout. You know, as you interact with the functions of the package, and then when the session clears, it clears it. And so, you know, I think that's part of like creating your own environment with that is because you don't want those cache credentials to carry on into other sessions. That's what I'm thinking anyways, when you're talking about it, but yeah. you know, why you'd want to have a separate environment for that. So you can build it up, break it back down. Yeah, I guess it's um, maybe a more flexible approach than having some, some R6 object that contains it all, right? Um, as some other packages might do, but yeah, I guess if you, if you can't do that, then then it's better to do this um, separate specific environment for for those objects. Um, another thing within the archive is don't use T or F, just use true or false. Um, I read about this, in, I think it was in the advanced uh, book that like T and F are just variables that, you know, reference to true and false. So uh, yeah, that you shouldn't use them for, um, for the package. Um, it also checks your data, your documentation, um, you know, it checks complete completeness and um, that you're not missing any specific fields within the .rd files um, and checks your maximum line width. That's, that catches me out like all the time. Um, and it runs examples in the help files. Um, you can use run examples from DevTools just to run this specifically. Um, I'm going to say there was like a, post a tweet um, the other day where someone asked like, oh, could we get um, a check to just run the things that failed in the last check? And um, and someone tweeted like, oh, here's a, um, and they, they, um, they posted a link to the, like what's actually run when you run check. And it's like a single humongous function that's like 6,000 lines long. And it's like, <laughs> no, <laughs> not currently. Um, so yeah, that's um, this is one that you can use to run just the examples, but there's not a really quick way to do the whole um, check just the things that failed last. Um, so it does a demo, it's a compiled code. Um, and it uh, so within the compiled code section, it's sort of says it checks for all foreign function calls within the compiled code, and it runs all the tests. Um, if the, if the test pass when you run test, uh, sorry, I put it, I should have added open close brackets here. Um, so when it runs, when you use DevTools test, but it doesn't within the R um, command check or you know when you run DevTools check, there's probably something um, in your testing environment that's um, that's gone wrong. Um, I was work on this before because I was wanting to access something from my global environment within the test function. And it works when I've got, um, when I'm running DevTools test, but it doesn't when I've got the R command check because I can't see my global environment. Um, so that's just a bit, yeah, problematic. And often I find if I just restart R, like, you know, I don't know what's control shift F10 um, on Windows and run the test again, then often like they're matching up again between the, the check and the test. Um, 
for the vignettes, it'll it'll check them and rebuild them. Um, uh, but know that if you're making changes to your package and then you're rebuilding the vignette, um, you have to also install, like run run install on your package because those um, changes won't be effective until you have reinstalled in terms of building the vignette. Um, this can be pretty slow, rebuilding the vignette. And if you're not working on something that uh, you want to test on your vignette, then you can um, specify vignettes equals false in the DevTools check. That can just speed things up, especially if you've got like I don't know, many vignettes or they're pretty long-winded. All right, so there are all the like uh, interesting takes I found within the checks um, here. Obviously, there's other ones, um, but I won't get into it. I think that's... Um, there's sort of like further reading. And if you if you find that your check fails for something else, then this would probably be a pretty good first like place to look. Um, so I'm going to skip to releasing to CRAN. And this chapter is all about um, sort of how to prepare and release the package to CRAN, um, which will be easier if you're passing checks already. So these are sort of the, the seven steps that this um, chapter is all about. Um, sort of picking a version number, run and document your um, Archman check. Check your align with the CRAN policies. Update your readme and news.md file. Um, it should probably have a CRAN comments file there as well. Um, submit the package to CRAN, prepare for the next version, um, and then publicize your, your fresh release if successful. So for the actual submission process, I just use DevTools release. I think there is a manual way where you can like upgrade, upload the bundled package to CRAN, but um, DevTools release just does it all for you. So just, just use that. Um, and this includes, it'll find like the CRAN comments.md file in your um, package directory and, and use that as well. Um, if you want to make this, you can usually use this package to create that file. Um, it's really helpful. And this, um, then you you describe the results from the Archimount check and the systems that you use. Um, and you may also um, describe like where you ran those systems, like if you use it on our hub or um, or like I don't know, maybe maybe you've got a whole testing a uh, whole like. Uh, checking suite on different operating systems through GitHub Actions, and you can mention that as well. You know, say that you know got got no checks, uh, no warnings or errors or uh, notes on any of those systems, or if you do, on which systems you got you got those. Actually, as a tangent, I I find that like on the GitHub Actions, I've had like failures on the Mac OS um, check. And um, and then I just rerun it, just that failed job, and it works. And I have no idea why. <laughs> anyway, that's that's a, a recent complaint. I don't know why that's going on. Um, but anyway, um, I sort of use the GitHub Actions, and I I don't know what the difference is between how they would perform versus um, a check on our hub. Um, if you specify that the versions, you know, the versions are exactly the same, I don't know what the difference would be, or whether you need to really run the R Hub um, check as well if you have the um, GitHub Actions as well already already going. So if you have an OS specific problem, like I might have with the with the Mac system, um, ideally if you want to test it out, then you use a virtualization tool so you can debug it locally. Or you do what I do, where you just send, uh, you know, you just push repeatedly to GitHub until you solve your problem. Um, and the worst thing that you should just never do is just submit to CRAN and hope for the best or expect them to help you at all. Um, so yeah, I, ideally you, you fix all your problems so it works on all operating systems. Um, and I think they require that um, it works on at least all but two. So for the results, um, you need to have no errors or warnings, and you should avoid as many notes as possible. Um, I realize I'm actually like probably 
assumed. I'll just make that a bit bigger. Um, so you should avoid all uh, as many notes as possible. If they can't be avoided, be open about it in your um, CRAN comments. There will always be a note. Yeah, this is what I said before. There will all be, always be a note for the first release of a package to CRAN. So just mention this also in the CRAN comments. You know, say this is the first release of this. Um, and maybe it'll be obvious from the version of being like 001. But um, yeah, just, just good to mention that. Oh my God. Um, it is uh, your responsibility to ensure the downstream packages are not totally broken by your updates. Um, and yeah, this is, I couldn't quite make total sense of, of this section in the, in the book, um, but there's this package rev depth check, uh, dependency check, um, and we should use this rather than the superseded, you know, um, rev depth check within DevTools. Um, and you can access this through the use this package, but I couldn't even install rev dependency check um, on my system. Um, and it seems like it's not on CRAN right now, but this still works. So I guess we should be using the use this package to do this. Um, and this checks um, which packages there are on CRAN that depend on your package and um, and you know what how how your package would affect those. Um, if you do cause breaking changes, to downstream packages, then you should notify um, the maintainers of those packages with some notice before you um, submit an updated version of that updated version to CRAN. And you should mention this in the CRAN comments. I mean, that might be a long way away, but it's still you know, developing packages that you know, expecting other people to depend on it. Um, but yeah. So for the CRAN policies, they require that you have a very stable email address um, because that's the only way that they have to contact you. So maybe don't, I don't know if it's good practice to use like a work email address if it's, you know, you know people change jobs, um, but, but yeah. So use a, use a stable email address that you expect to have access to uh, for a long time. Um, you have to have copyright and, uh, and your license in the description file and uh, make all reasonable efforts to make it work across, across all systems. So um, I guess there's a problem if, if you know, you make a package and it only works for, you know, one operating system and you know, oh, I could make it work, but nah, you know, they might, they're not for that. So um, yeah, you should make all efforts to make it work across all systems. Um, yeah, I alluded to this before, do not make any external changes without explicitly um, getting user permission. Um, so that means to the global environment, writing files to their system, installing other R packages, quitting R, sending info across the internet or um, opening other programs. Um, it's pretty interesting because I mean, some functions which, you know, maybe it's, it's just given in their name, you know, if you're like, making a directory like make dir like it's obvious that what you're doing you're not having to ask for you know extra permission to do that um but yeah i guess you just need to be really open about it if you're incidentally making new files rex can i ask a question hmm? yeah about the make all the reasonable efforts to get package working across platforms fine i am as Trying to think if I know of any package that works on only a specific operating system, and I can't think of any like any R package. Do you guys um, like what? What are the reasons that an R package would work on only a particular operating system, but not at this? Hmm. If if the R infrastructure is already in place like what are the reasons like a specific package would be incompatible with an operating system yeah um i can't think of many examples that don't work entirely but i mean there's a handful of um like packages for running things in parallel like i think mm -hmm. the for each doesn't do anything on windows 
Um, it like it doesn't doesn't actually do things in parallel on Windows. So I've used like parallel, which I think is more across systems. Um, well, I guess if you're really lazy with like um, making file path structures, then you could you know have backslashes instead of you know I guess you should use file path like the function and then specifying different you know the you know, the safer way to do things across systems, but um, I guess if you're lazy, you'd have a work for just a system that you're developing on and not necessarily all. Um, yeah, I don't know. Where, where else do you, does anyone have any ideas where you could, you could break something for a specific operating system? I think like base OS type dependencies, right? Differences between Linux, Mac, and Windows. Uh, the, the immediately first thing that came to mind, Rex, you already mentioned was the, the namespace, uh, the, uh, the file path. Um, forward slash and backslash. I can't tell you how many times uh, that one catches you off guard, uh, especially if you are using multiple operating systems. Um, but no, the, like the, the dependency, what I'm referring to in that regard is like the the under, uh, okay, like, like for example, Aaron, uh, let's say Windows relies on the registry as their uh, mechanism for management of program process IDs. Uh, where in, you know, Unix, it's, uh, uh, I'm going to sound ignorant when I can't remember, it's not lib, uh, it's not et cetera, bins maybe. Uh, there's a, it would be the equivalent, as bad as this comparison would be, it'd be the equivalent of a, of a Linux registry. Uh, but there is no something like that. Um, and that's what kind of makes Linux unique. That could be a direct relation of how you're managing a lot of uh, the environment of your package or function calls, et cetera. Does that help at all? I'll try to find that reference. So I'm not, if anybody watches the video later and says, well, I thought you're the Linux guy and now I'm losing my brain on <laughs> what that, what that, what that uh, uh, working in process ID environment is called. System D is, is one of them, uh, but there's another one too that uh, manages like your process IDs. And Wine is an equivalent of running Windows-based apps on Linux, um, but it actually just builds this kind of weird pseudo registry so that your Windows apps can manipulate inside anyway. This might be off base, but I'm, I mean, while you were talking, Ryan, I was thinking about like, what if you were building a command line tool, you know, because you can build a command line tool using R in the background. So you know, maybe you're only intending to use it on a Unix-based system. Uh, uh, path, uh, path, echo, uh, those are things that have caught me off guard uh, recently working in Windows. Um, I realized uh, PowerShell um, kind mm -hmm. of looks the same as Unix-y sort of command line, but yeah, there is no direct echo ability. Um, you have to use a different command to execute the same concept of what Windows would would be the equivalent of. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, there's, there's probably a handful of things that I'm like not even not even thinking of. But uh, the one that I've definitely like run into the most pain with is like trying to run things in parallel and then packages that only doesn't work for my system. Maybe I should just move away from Windows. Yeah, it's a, a subtle hint that they're giving me. Um, so the last thing there was um, don't submit updates uh, too frequently. I guess this is a point of having like a development version of your package that you work on and then, you know, eventually submit to CRAN. You don't need to, you know, submit to CRAN with every push that you give, put to GitHub. Um, it's a bit overcooked, so yeah. They're all volunteers, right? So, you know, you got to use that time like, nicely. You can't just expect heaps of all those people working at Cram. Um, so this is not in the book, but it's another sort of pre-submission check or not even pre-submission, just like check that you could do. Um, I should have also added in style a style package because I think I mean, that's also just makes things look nicer. Um, so I'm going to share um, share screen of, 
by our studio. So this is a package that I'm working on. It's definitely not cleaned up very much. Yeah. But and I've just run this um, good, good practice um, function. And it sort of looks through all your code and tells you where you're doing things where, it, where you could do it better, right? And it is sort of like a check, but I think there's like hundreds of things that are checks, not just 50. Um, and uh, for example, it'll say, you know, what you're missing from the description file. It told me a really good tip the other day uh, that I've been caught out with before. It said, get rid of the date in your description file because it's unnecessary. And if you don't have a date, then it'll just use the date that you submit to CRAN as the date. Um, previously, I like had a package that I submitted to CRAN and then I had some other like super minor thing wrong with it. So I resubmitted like a month later when I realized that I had feedback. And they'll, then it got sent back to me again, being like, oh, your date's old. You gotta update that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, that's just such a painful thing to have to resubmit over. Um, but you get rid of the date, then you know, no worries. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things where it'll say, you know, don't use, don't iterate in a for loop, say over one to the number of rows of something or other when you should be using the like seek along functions instead because they're a bit safer. Um, and there's uh, a whole set of, you know, things where it says you suck for these reasons and how to fix it up. So um, for example, it's gonna tell me that my coverage sucks and, and I should do something about that. Um, and it'll, it'll sort of say where you're missing out on that. Um, uh, you know, writing long lines and, and where that where that problem is. So um, yeah, super super helpful just to make your card your code um, look a lot nicer and maybe be a bit safer to um, other problems that aren't captured within a check or necessarily your current testing suite. Um, yeah, I think this is largely just <laughs> me having those like three things on repeat, like bad coverage, long lines and using one to length of something else. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's that's um, another fun check um, to do before submission. Maybe just so the person reviewing your code isn't like, oh, look at this guy, having like quiet judgment for my coding practice. Um, so for the, when you're running, or when you're all set to release, you can run dev tools release. This builds a package and runs um, our command check one last time. Um, and it prompts the user to do some final checks like running um, uh, spell check. I forget what package that's from, um, but that sort of checks the spelling in your package. Um, it says, you know, have you checked it on our hub? Have you committed all the changes? And it checks that you've committed everything that has been changed um, to your local repository before submission. Um, and then uh, when you say yes, 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 or like, you know, all the fun responses like, yes, absolutely, for sure. And um, all those, uh, it'll say, you know, are you finally ready to submit? And you say yes, and it'll upload, it'll bundle the package and upload it to CRAN and include the CRAN comments. And afterwards, you will get an email confirmation to say, you know, was this, was this you? You hit yes, and then it'll, it'll send it off to CRAN for review. Um, and then the, oh, spell it, uh, typo there. Um, then once the CRAN maintainer or the CRAN um, person has reviewed it, they'll get back to you with either like approval or, um, or feedback. So if you get rejected, you don't need to respond to the email. You'll get an email from the person that reviewed the package and they'll say, you know, what you need to change or what's wrong. Um, and you don't need to respond to it. It's not like a journal article where you need to like respond to the editor or the reviewers or whatever. Um, you just need to fix the problems and mark in your CRAN comments that it's a resubmission when you resubmit. Um, and show in that resubmission section of your CRAN comments file how you've addressed the things that the, um, the previous you know, review um, noted. 
if you get accepted in you know, a great success, um, you'll get a, um, I think it's a CRAM submission file in, like as soon as you hit release and, and send it, it'll generate this CRAM submission file in your project directory. And, um, and you don't need to do, you don't need to put it on GitHub or anything. You just wait until you get this acceptance email and then you can use that transmission file to tag a release on GitHub. So um, the easiest way to do this is to use the use this package yet again um, and run this and it'll create a draft release on your GitHub um, repository. And you just go there and it's pretty much like uh, the, I'll show you what one looks like. Um, so I didn't do one for some of these, but, um, oh geez. So this makes your, um, release it will pretty much draft all this based on your CRAN comments. I think CRAN comments, the news.md. I view a news.md file and it'll include the source code um, zipped up in your you know, bundled package. So I didn't write any of this. It just, um, it just got generated when I did that tag release from uh, use this from here. And then you just go to the GitHub page and, you know, draft it's all done for you just say like yep i'm happy um send it and it's done so after you've done that you want to make sure that when you make further changes to your package that are on github that you're not um that you're doing so under a new um, version number so you have to update the um description file the version number there to add the um dot nine thousand suffix to um to the version and then you're happy to you know make changes um, and people know it's not the safe release or the, the stable release of that package. And after that, you're, you're pretty much done. You should just publicize and let people know. So um, you can tweet about it and tag our stats and it'll get retweeted by all those, um, all those bots. Um, and you can post about it in a blog and send it to the R package mailing list. I've never sent it to this mailing list. I don't know how many people that gets out to, but um, yeah, I might do that next time. Um, that's it. That's it. That was a bit of a speed run. Um, I know there's a lot of things within this check um, chapter that I probably didn't mention, um, but I think a lot of them become like pretty, like the results from the check are pretty straightforward for a lot of them. They pretty much point you to what's wrong and it probably makes sense why, um, why it doesn't like them. Um, but uh, yeah, it, does anyone have any questions or want to discuss anything about this? I was going to post one to the group as a whole. Uh, if we know that there's currently approximately 18,000 CRAN packages available, how many do you believe are out there on GitHub that would use DevTools install that aren't on CRAN? My question would be like, if there's 18,000 out there, I can almost guess that we'll multiply that by 10. And that's probably what it may be out there in the wild that people haven't went through the formal workflow of, of submitting to CRAN. Um, do you have any thoughts in that regard? Um, I'm asking, cause I know you've experienced the actual submittal to CRAN and, and gone through the workflow as a whole. Yeah, I bet there's heaps on Zenodo as well. Right. I mean, because a lot of people that want, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm thinking from like the academia side more than like, the, you know, the majority of our users, but a lot of people want like a citable um, version of a package and you can do that through Zenodo, you know, you get a DOI. Um, and also heaps of like, um, you can publish a package and just like, submit your source code or something with um with the article and people have like a citable version that's all they care about you know they just care about having a a thing that 
you can cite in the future, not necessarily like the, the checks and stability that comes with having it on CRAN. Um, I don't know. I, I think it'd be like, I think it might scare people a lot, but maybe unnecessarily, or maybe I've just had like a really easy experience because my package is something that complicated uh, with getting them onto CRAN. So, yeah. I well, I was know. thinking, no, I, I mean, so package development is kind of like street credit or I'm viewing it when others are discussing, oh yeah, I've got this package. Um, the, uh, the actual development commitment and maintain maintenance of that package, like you're telling others within the community, hey, I'm here to answer your questions. You know, here's my package, here's what it's used for, you know, all the documentation, et cetera. But it, it, it's really like you're, you're now becoming part of a, a more collective whole by being published to CRAN. Uh, so it's not, you're not out in the fringes of, of the R community. You're now in the, the core of, of the uh, team, I guess. And my other question, not related to that, is uh, when, <laughs> when you submit to CRAN, um, is there any stats or any number of employees? Uh, are there volunteers or are they actual R Studio employees that are reviewing and, and committing to it? Is it like, you know, three people and that's what's maintaining the world or is it, you know, a whole host of army that is, uh, is doing these validations? I think in my five submissions, I've only had two different people, but I don't know how many people are doing it. Maybe there's just like two people that do all, like all, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. There's a cartoon that comes to mind of like, you know, the, the, the world that we think we know, and then actually what, what happens, you know, behind the scenes is like, you know, one person frantically pulling all the knobs and buttons and et cetera. Yeah. I've always had that question of like, you know, I've never submitted to cram, but I wonder, you know, I just want to know how many people are volunteering their time to maintain that and to review it. Like, I guess the other question that I have for you, Rex, cause you have experience and I guess anybody who's had experience in this, like, what are they reviewing? Is it just like, basically like, yeah, this, you know, they, they said the R command check worked. It's good to go. I mean, are they like actually going through like a code review or is it just like they check the boxes? It's good to go. Like what, what's been your experience in that? I didn't think they could. Have, like, I don't think they could possibly do a full code review like because some some packages are huge right and i mean even when you like submit a paper to a journal they don't even review the whole thing like <laughs> how could you expect people on cram to review like that potentially you know thousands and thousands of lines of code um i reckon they probably get most of it done from like checking the checks themselves and running the tests and making sure you've got tests and maybe if you don't having a closer look but I guess they put a lot of trust in the developer that their testing suite works and all the rest. Yeah, yeah cause that's, what, that's what, yeah, cause I was like, yeah, you know, like I was just thinking it was just like 18,000 packages, like you'd have a significant amount of people. So it's probably very automated, like, you know, they're just putting a lot of trust in everybody. And then like, did they pass the automated checks? Is it gonna run on our systems? Like, you know, cause the other question that I had too is, is like vulnerabilities, I mean, like, that's something that hasn't been talked about a lot either is just like you know there's been some sprinkles of it like yeah you're not supposed to use like dot exe files in your thing and all this other stuff but it's just like you know i get but it's open source right like there is no guarantee or warranty on any of this stuff so but yeah it's just interesting to think about who's who's in the background doing it so i was going to share another one with rex on on russ uh russ hyde is our uh mastering shiny uh first mm -hmm. cohort facilitator and now the JavaScript for R, but um, Russ made a comment in one of the sessions where he's a portion contributor to the Linter, Lint R package. Um, and he goes, it's it's ironic that Lint R actually valid, uh, sorry, errors on its own Lint test function. <laughs> like the package itself is actually telling the package that it's in error but there really isn't an error. And so he was, he kind of went off on it on a tangent about that topic. And I, I, I only wanted to smile about uh, what, what Colin was referring to of 
submitting to CRAN, you know, what, what kind of exhaustive checks are done. I, I, I have, Colin, I support your statement. I, it's got to be a lot of automation. I, I can't imagine that you're, you're really doing an ex exhaustive review of what the intent of the developer is, is implying. You just have to take it in good faith that following these policies and, and, and you know, going through these test functions is going to catch any of those possibilities. I am muted, Colin. Thanks. Uh, thanks for passing this along, Brendan. Like, um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about this, but like the R open, you know, R open sci, uh, yeah, they have like a whole book down of their like review process, which looks really interesting. And I was just looking at like the number of editors and reviewers, and it only looks like maybe, I would say maybe 150. If that, I mean, I might be being a little generous, but there's a lot of people listed on here. So, so that's interesting that there's this peer review for this for our open sci, which is kind of neat. Yeah, I think there's just kind of like that, like kind of like that air, like kind of that like air of mystery of like you know what's going on in the background right so because i've all you know it's always like that scary thing of like you know submit your package to cran and what's going to happen to it like but it sounds like you know there's a lot you know there's just so much going on that like it's probably really automated um and then they you know they go through those checks and make sure that everything's good to go I guess the other question I had was with like the comments with the, uh, where were the, um, the CRAN comments? Like that's something that you draft, right? You draft that, you put it into your pack, like in the bundle. And then when you submit it, then the reviewer brings that down, opens that up and reviews that file basically. So if you had like certain notes that you can't confront or you can't fix or you can't address in your package, like something, you know, you just can't do it that's where you put that comment and you just say like, Hey, we know of this warning. There's nothing we can do about it. Kind of thing. Is that, is, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. Let me just, um, check. Uh, okay. This is one that I, um, the package that I've sent to Cran where there was a note on, um, on the Linux, um, checks. Just said the file size is really big, um, and I just mentioned all the the test environments that um, I used, um, and this was one from that other package that I opened up before, and I just say the test environments, the uh, the results from the R command check, and um, I also mentioned that you know there's a first release of the package, so this is the CRAN comments. Um, File and I think in the news.md file, I sort of, I mean, maybe first release, you just say like what, what it does broadly. Um, so I guess that's the difference. I think the CRAN comments are mainly about like the checks um, and the news.md file is about what it does. Yeah, because when you mentioned, when I saw that, I started digging through like, you know, dplyr and ggplot2 and was looking at their, like what their CRAN comments were, because they're on GitHub as well. And they're pretty much, they're pretty standard of what you got too, you know, like, hey, we ran the R command check results, zero warning, zero errors, blah, blah, blah. But I think ggplot2 has more than dplyr in them, but it's kind of interesting to see like what they're putting into their our command checks or not their command checks, but their CRAN comment files. So that's cool. Yeah, I just I just opened up the um I'll just share it. The dplyr one, <laughs> like 3000 dependencies. Um and yeah, I guess saying that you know the check is fine. Yeah. Just a minor release. Maybe that's probably something worth including as well, like not about what the release of the update does, but it just said it's a minor one. I guess if you had a major release and they would be okay with um, potential problems to dependencies, but not for minor ones. I don't know. 
you know, mm-hmm. if you're expecting breaking changes with a major release and or if, if you have zero breaking changes then and you said it was a major release maybe it's not really a major release i don't know I mean, you can go back in time too. You could hit history and look at like what those commits were. Like you could hit history and then like see what they were. Ooh. Oh, wait. Which... Are you open just a file? Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. Right. Oh yeah. So then, yeah. There's definitely some as some they. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. Well, excellent. Hmm. So, any other questions, comments for for Rex, or just any general comments that people have about what we discussed tonight, or the book club in general? I guess one general question I have is why there aren't more organizations like our open side or like, I just imagine CRAN, I see why they're the authority, but it's like if all scientists had to submit to like nature, for example, like why there aren't other um, alternative sources for software peer review, especially because at least I've seen on Twitter, a lot of people are unhappy with the review process sometimes on CRAN. Volunteers. (laughs) Go ahead, Rex. Sorry. Think, Go ahead. I've seen like um uh like the Journal of Open Source Software has um I think they include some code review and Journal of Statistical Software might do as well. Um but yeah, pretty limited, right? Pretty limited options in terms of like getting code review. And even if you do like, and even if the I don't know, the service or the journal includes, you know, this is what reviewers should be reviewing. How do you really know that that's <clears throat> going to be the case? I mean, there's such variability in reviewers. So um, there's no guarantee, really. Um, yeah, tricky. I, I would sort of trust someone in-house to do a better review than um, necessarily some, like, independent, you know, service especially if it's like run by volunteers, which like all of them are. So yeah, maybe this is like me developing into like a rant about academic journals though. So maybe I'm projecting. I mean, there's no monetary, I mean, there's no monetary value behind it, right? Like, you know, in, ac- in academia, you know, you're somewhat compensated for your participation for, you know, review, but this is just straight volunteering, you know? Like, I mean, you're learning stuff, but, you know, it's just, that's hard, hard. And too, like, this is just outside of R because the R community is great, but like, you know, you'll, I'll hear like some like, po- you know, podcast interviews from other people and they're like, sometimes open source is hard to work in because, you know, not everybody, it, I don't, this isn't the R community because the R community is very nice and, and very welcoming, but like in other pockets of open source software, people are not very nice. (laughs) And so it's just like, it's a struggle, you know, like if you're volunteering your time and people aren't nice, it's like, you know, so I guess the, the moral of the story with that be is just like, just be nice, you know, and understand that these, these people are overloaded and they're giving their time for free. And so be very nice when you're working with, with these other people. And so, um, I don't see an issue with that in our community because the our community is pretty, pretty happy and, and pretty open and pretty, um, um, pretty open to everybody. So cool. So any other questions for Rex? So I did mention that tonight was last night, but, um, I do have some news. Uh, I think we're going to hold one more session for next week. Um, John the Geek just told me that uh, Jenny Bryan wanted to join in on one of our sessions for next week. So uh, he told me I I could announce it. So uh, if you're available next week, Jenny Bryan would like to join in on our session 
for us to ask questions. And so, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I don't know. I just, he just told me this right now. So, um, yeah, I guess we're not done. <laughs> that's so but, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm actually kind of like, I'm kind of starstruck. Like, I, I know this is recorded, so John's probably going to watch this over and over again. But um, yeah, I think she said she's going to join in for next session. And I think that's going to be really, really uh, gracious of her time. And so we're not done. If uh, I think we'll hold one more session next week. And then um, I'm not sure how we'll run this. Uh, I John has mentioned this in the past that this could be a possibility and obviously it got confirmed. So that's great. Um, I'm not sure how we'll run the session because I know, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we'll run the session. I'll have to ask John how that will work because I know when we, cause the sessions are open. And so I'm not sure how that's going to work. Cause I know, he, I know he's invited like Hadley to some sessions before. And so I think he tried to control the flow because I mean, this is our core group, right? but you put like Jenny Ryan or Hadley Wickham are going to be on a thing. More people will join in, which is fine. It's welcoming. So I'm not sure how that will run. I'll have to ask John how it will run, but um, maybe we'll probably to maximize her time, probably think about, think about some questions that you might ask her um, so that we can maximize the time that we have with her. I have a few questions that I would, that I definitely want to ask her for sure. But, you know, somebody who, somebody who has this, um, somebody who's, very well known in the community and, and gracious with their time. I think it'd be worth some time to think about some like questions to um, get as much out, get as much from that session as possible. So that's uh, super exciting. I, I'm actually really happy about that. That's great. Um, so yeah, I was going to say some final comments, but I probably can, res oh, I'll probably say them now just in case we don't get a chance to have final comments next week, but I just, I just want to say thank you to this entire group, uh, this entire core group. I mean, it is amazing to kind of look back on the past 20, 22 weeks. I think there was probably only one week where we took a break. And I think that just speaks, you know, volumes to like this group's like grit and tenacity to get through this book and to challenge ourselves and to push ourselves to learn and to learn from each other. And I think that's also a really good sign of like the health of this community. And so I think it's really great to see people participating in within it and we can't participate without great people. And so I think it's really, I think another great thing just outside of learning from all of you, it's just been getting to know all of you. Um, like I said, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting that not only do I know somebody that lives in my, my town that I live in knows our stats, but I get to meet people from around the world and I get to meet people with many different backgrounds and ask for their help. And so I really appreciate and just want to say thank you for everybody's time and effort. And I really appreciate it. So if I don't get to do final comments next week, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say. So thank you very much. So I can hang out a little bit more if people want to chat some more or if they people want to kind of brainstorm some questions here real quick, we sure can. Um, if not, you know, I'll, I'll maybe kind of think about putting something together in the Slack to think about some questions and work with John. But if you got to jump off, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I'll see you in the Slack. So, but. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Colin, for leading us to this book. Yeah. Thanks for facilitating thing, right? Yeah. Thanks to you all as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to hold another one. I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, I don't know yet. I'm getting kind of an itch to get to back to some like, you know, some stats modeling stuff because I've been doing the computer science stuff a little much. So be on the lookout. I will be facilitating another one here soon. I don't know which one, but I, I hope if it's if it's of interest to you, I definitely hope you will join. So I was going to ask if anybody is curious of Sparkle R. That's a uh, uh, one of the uh, books that were at the R conference. Uh, there was a post on Twitter, uh, or I, maybe it was on Discord. Uh, they were commenting that uh, the author was signing uh, the book, and I thought, oh, yeah, I really need to jump in. I've talked to Colin about this in the past of facilitating a book club. It's more of the commitment and uh, assurance of of actually doing the book. So. If, if 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 somebody's not there to present, you're kind of on the on the hook for for continuing on. I was either thinking about regression and other stories, 
Um, or I was thinking about John put, uh, put up one with like the R for DS, but the Python version for it. So that would be really interesting. Uh, well, yeah, there's... the oh, relation ahead, to, Ryan. well, no, I'm saying the relation that posit is making to Python. That would be a really, uh, interesting, uh, book to include users. Yeah. So I don't know. Does anybody else have any other interested in books like that they would be interested in? Like, which is the Python version of the Alpha DS that you mentioned? Uh, John posted, where did he post it? I think he might've posted in, um, oh, where did he post it? Was it in the book code facilitators? Oh, I can't remember. I could send you a link. Or where was maybe book club requests? Yeah, book club requests. Here, I can send the link to the post. I don't know. Oh, I I, I, see I briefly scanned. You see it? Yeah, I briefly scanned it. It looks interesting. I don't know if I'll facilitate that one because there's a lot of interest in it, but um, I definitely want to be a part of it because, you know, I guess, I guess posit is embracing more Python. And so I think it's probably time. It is time. And as you're going to have to I, do, you're going to have to do a hundred, you're going to have to do a hundred percent of all of the media in either Jupiter or Cordo. Uh, that's a that's a requirement. No, I'm joking. Um, the uh, the nature of how we're developing in our markdown, and then now here it is. There's a lot of support for Cordo or or even in in this uh, Jupiter mindset as well. <laughs> I think it's just time. You know, I bit the bullet on SQL, and I think I've I've gotten better at that. But I think it's just time for Python. As much as it's just like dragging it out of me, I think I got to do it. So. Um, but it will make me more well-rounded. So, yeah, but I know that group's going to get started. There are John's like, he's kind of drumming up, seeing what kind of interest is out there. Um, but like I said, for me, like personally for facilitating one, I'm probably going to do a modeling book because I need to, I'm getting that stats itch. I've been doing too much computer science with mastering shiny and, and our package development. It's like, I got to get back to some of the stats stuff than, than the computer science stuff. <laughs> but Cool. Is that regression? Oh, whatever, Rex. That regression and other stories book is that free? Yeah, it's open source. Um, regression. I, I believe. No, I think it is a college course, Rex. To answer that question, uh, I think all of the book work that goes along with it, though, there's a video series that the uh, author is uh, committing to. Um, I only tracked with it about halfway through the book and I kind of trailed off. Um, but the, the videos, if you, if you want to watch the, I think it was the first cohort, um, it had some really good conversations, uh, regarding it, it, it takes, it takes a, uh, a more layman's approach to stats in general. Uh, it's a really, really great, um, activity, uh, both for a refresher, but even changing kind of your mind. If you're really in that hardcore, uh, statistical model type mindset i i think yeah, it was yeah. for oh go ahead rex oh I, no i was just looking at the um yeah i just found the free like pdf version of the book online but yeah no it looks really really interesting i'd be very keen for that yeah i need to i need to get back to practicing my modeling skills so we tried to do i tried to do what was the one that everybody's been doing recently like ISLR. Stats for the rest of us, or no? That's I think it is ISLR. Um, yeah, that one is. I, uh, oh, that is a heavy book. Um, that's a heavy commitment. Yeah, I, I need to start. I need to start back because it's been a few years. Like you know, it's been a few years since I've done some modeling, and so it's like, let's just start. Let's just start simple here and work my way back up because ISLR was like, it was just too much <laughs> for what where I was at. Like I was like. Mm. You you were you were literally flopped into a differential equations class and and somebody is just going off on some theory of you know algorithm and you're like I, I don't even know what this person's talking about. No, I'm joking. No, my favorite part in the book was like, well, we're gonna take this approach with not a lot of math, tons of math. And it's I'm it's, it's like, literally Greek equations. Like you're just oh my goodness, it's so uh, hieroglyphics almost reading it. 
yeah well that's just the thing it's just like it's gonna be an accessible book and then it's just like large equations and i'm like okay i got i just gotta start off slow let's just go back so i don't know if anybody has interest in regressions and other stories like i'd be interested in in facilitating that one um and yeah i definitely need some more stats experts on that because i'll be coming at it from uh not doing modeling for probably uh i wouldn't say i haven't done lining i've done like basic linear modeling but nothing like to the level of that book in a while so but so I definitely would be uh, looking for some experts to be in, in that group. So, but it depends on the, it depends on like how much interest there is too for different books. Like it's, it's totally driven by the community. So if there's no interest, it's like, John's not going to put the resources into do it. And so, but. Well, I don't know if everyone, everyone reads the posts about our traffic, uh, the YouTube traffic, John will post every once in a while. Some of these book clubs, although, you know, you have your core members and, and you know, we're meeting weekly, et cetera, there is countless, countless individuals that are just watching the YouTube video lurking in the background that, you know, may not actively take a role in the, in the presentation, but um, definitely watch the videos for sure. Don't say that. You're going to make me like self-conscious about what Oh, it is. Present. No, no, no. <laughs> once, once I learned that, I'm like, does that, yeah. Uh, is it gonna make you youtube famous i don't know i'm joking about that but i've done so many of these that it's like i don't know i for the youtube part of it it's like it is what it is you know <laughs> i guess for i guess i do want to do what's best for other people i don't know how long john's gonna cut this off but if there are people that are still watching this like uh definitely participate in this um I am going to put a, like a, a, a in the wins and stuff that we finished it. Cause I think it's good to post it out in the community. Like, Hey, there are people that are finishing these books, so like join the group, be a part of this group. So if anybody's watching this later, like if you're like interested in like even just being a part of a group, do it because like, if you just jump in, you're going to learn so much more and it's so worth your time. And so like, if anybody's sitting there thinking like, Oh, I don't know if I want to be a part of this group just do it. I mean, it's just worth it because every group that I've been a part of so, so far, I've learned so much from so many other people and it's just been an amazing experience. And so, and you get a network and you get to connect with people. So what's the benefit? Well, you know, what's not the benefit of that? So. Well, I see the Slack is extremely active, right? All of the, the community for r for ds and there's, I don't know, what is it? 10,000 plus users that are currently on, on the community, but I don't see a lot of users posting on Twitter to advertise, uh, you know, for the book club, I'm not, I'm not imp implying that anybody should do that. Um, I just find it as one more activity that, that could, uh, spawn some more generation into a given single book club. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how that, you know, how the interest gets generated with this too, you know, I think it's a great, I think it's a great resource. I just, yeah, that's a great, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure, Ryan. I, uh, the, the, the whole social media concept has been lost. I, 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 I'm in that era prior to social media being such a big presence. So um, I, I, I would say that I'm of the older faction that doesn't use social media very often. Um, I, I'm feeling a little inadequate when I'm posting things. I have to ask my daughter, am I doing this the right way? Am I hashtagging properly kind of concept? So Sweet. So, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I just like, I've, I've kind of side conversation here with John, but I think we'll probably figure out a way to do some questions. You know, if people have questions, think about them. We'll collect some questions and then we'll see if we'll have some time for free discussion. So, um, yeah, I'm excited for next week. I think this is going to be interesting to have Jenny Bryan with us um, and talk more with her. And so I, I hope everyone else can join. Um, but like I said, I appreciate everybody's time and I appreciate everybody joining in. And so I'm going to jump off. Uh, don't be a stranger. Be on the lookout. I'll see everybody next week. But um, if you have any questions, you know, I'll be in the Slack or if you just want to reach out or anything like that, please reach out. And then. Um, you know, I'll see you in other book clubs. See everybody later. See you Thank next you. week. See you later. Have a good one.